There are few civilizations throughout all of history that rival Rome in size, longevity, power, influence, and sheer historical and cultural impact, in the Mediterranean at least. It's thanks to Rome's massive cultural legacy that in many countries Roman history is part of the standard school curriculum. Not only this, but ancient Rome has proven to be a fairly popular setting in all forms of art. As great and as important as I believe this to be, it's often through art and school that we get fed many common myths and misconceptions about the ancient Romans. With that out of the way, let's get into it. Romans always wore togas. The toga is easily the most iconic item of Roman clothing, and there are few images more iconic and common in Roman art than that of a male citizen wearing a toga. Be it in statues, mosaics, or frescoes, the sheer quantity of art depicting Romans this way can easily give us the idea that togas were simply the most common form of menswear in ancient Rome. Art, specifically portraits, served a very specific purpose, that of representing the client as they wished to be perceived. Often said statues or reliefs depicting the subject wearing a toga were for funerary purposes. The toga, next to signifying Roman citizenship, was something of a status symbol which emphasised the dignity of the wearer and his pride of being Roman. Next to the substantial amount of fabric required for a toga, another reason some have suggested for its more luxurious status is that it requires the help of one or two skilled people, possibly, but not necessarily, servants or slaves, to put on. All that to say, the toga likely wasn't the most popular garment for everyday use. That honour would probably go to the humble tunic, which was in fact commonly worn underneath the toga. The tunic was a simple garment with four holes and was very easy and cheap to produce. One reason as to why the toga probably wasn't worn predominantly is that it isn't exactly the most practical garment, as it restricts the mobility of the wearer considerably. It's highly unlikely that anyone would have done any manual labour whilst wearing a toga. During the warmer months of the year, especially in and around the Mediterranean, it's not hard to imagine that one might rather leave the house wearing just a tunic rather than piling on more layers with a toga. We also shouldn't forget that throughout the Roman Empire there were many local garments that would go on to be worn. The Greeks, for instance, never gave up on their chlamys or himation, and the Germanians along the Rhine didn't suddenly get rid of all their trousers. And as it is today, fashion changed with the times, and no doubt the Romans would have wanted to try out different styles of clothing. After all, wearing the same thing all the time does get rather dull. While we're on the topic of togas, it shouldn't go without mention that not all togas were white. Of course, among senators, a white toga with a purple stripe was the standard attire, but in general the Romans were quite fond of colours, and for non-political use, it's quite likely that the Romans would have gone for all sorts of colours. In mourning, for instance, it was common to wear a dark toga. I find the HBO TV series Rome depicts this rather well. The Roman Empire was consciously permanently split into two parts in the year 395 AD. In school, I was taught without much context that the Roman Empire split into two parts in the year 395 AD, into the Western and Eastern Roman Empire. This rather simplistic explanation led me to believe that the Western East had had a major falling out and continued forth as entirely separate political entities. As it turns out, it's a bit more complicated than that, the split came about not out of any hostilities, but because upon the death of Emperor Theodosius the Great, who had ruled over the entire empire, his sons Honorius and Arcadius each inherited the rule of half the empire. Never would it have crossed Theodosius's mind that the empire would be permanently split between an eastern and western emperor, and never would he have thought that the empire wouldn't at some point have come under control of a single emperor again it was still perceived as a singular empire. The rule of Honorius and Arcadius wasn't the first time that the governance of the empire had been divided amongst multiple emperors. The most obvious example of this is the Tetrarchy that was established by Diocletian in 293 AD and saw the empire split into four administrative zones, ruled by two senior and two junior emperors. 
Rome was sacked in 410 AD by simple barbarian invaders. While it cannot be denied that the Eternal City was sacked in 410 AD by a band of Visigoths led by their king Alaric, painting said Visigoths as simple barbarian invaders is massively oversimplifying a complex series of events. The Visigoths, while they were considered barbarians by the historians who wrote about the period, cannot truly be considered an outside force, as they had been in the service of the empire for multiple decades by 410. They were contracted as federati. Not too dissimilarly to mercenaries, federati were often barbarian tribes that were enlisted to protect the empire's borders, often in exchange for money, food, or simply the right to settle. By 410, the Visigoths' history of service for the empire was storied. Under Alaric alone, they had fought valiantly alongside the Romans in many battles. However, the Visigoths often felt that they were given a rough deal, and didn't think that the reward for their sacrifices in battle were proportionate. This led to many conflicts between the Romans and Visigoths. After many spats with the eastern portion of the empire, they were granted the right to settle in Moesia by the Emperor Theodosius the Great. When Theodosius died and Alaric became the chief of the Visigoths in 395, he sought to take from the Romans what he felt his people were owed. After sacking many cities, the eastern emperor Arcadius finally managed to rein Alaric in, possibly granting him the rank of Magister Militum, meaning Master of the Soldiers, in Illyricum. In 400, he would be stripped of this title again. This would be followed by riots within the eastern part of the empire against various groups of Goths. Alaric looked westwards. In 401, Alaric attempted his first invasion of Italy and besieged the then western capital of Mediolanum, modern-day Milan. He would, however, be beaten back by the extremely competent Roman Vandalic general Stilicho. Flavius Stilicho, at the time, more or less held power in the west, as he was effectively the regent of the 16-year-old Western Emperor Honorius, who was still too young to rule. After successfully fending off the Goths, Stilicho relocated the Western capital to the more easily defensible Ravenna, and started a series of negotiations with the Goths. Following the death of the Eastern Emperor Arcadius in 408, a mutiny against Stilicho erupted, and led the by then 23-year-old Honorius into believing Stilicho meant to betray him, and in place one of his own sons on the eastern throne. Thoroughly convinced, Honorius ordered the arrest and later execution of Stilicho. This brought the negotiations with the Goths back to square one, and Honorius was markedly less adept at diplomacy than his slain regent. In 408, Alaric and the Visigoths marched on Rome and besieged the Eternal City. Despite not having been the administrative capital for quite some time, it was still the cultural heart of the empire and was of immense religious importance. Alaric demanded annual payments and an official place within the Roman military hierarchy. The negotiations were hectic and Alaric broke off the siege twice, yet Honorius proved inept. And during the third siege, on the 24th of August, 410, the Visigoths broke into the city and plundered it for three days. All this to say that the Visigoths weren't just some invading barbarians that crossed the northern frontier and just waltzed into Italy and sacked Rome. The Visigoths were effectively a part of the Roman military and had been for decades. The Visigoths were also Romanized to some extent, having lived within the empire for decades and even having converted to Rome's state religion, Christianity albeit a heretical Aryan sect. Thus, it's rather inaccurate to simply view the Visigoths as complete outsiders and simple barbarians. The reason this event is so mythologized is because it's often slotted into a narrative of decline and fall, where the Roman Empire has grown so decadent, corrupt and weak that they have come to be conquered by the very barbarians whom they once conquered. This kind of decline and fall narrative is often heavily politicised, and you'll see a fair number of people invoking the fall of Rome to make some point about how our society is decadent, lazy, or corrupt, to the extent that will repeat Rome's fate. You can see this narrative being attached to religion, sexuality, immigration, you name it. No matter what's going on, someone, somewhere, will be convinced 
that we're reliving the fall of the Roman Empire. Talking about the fall of Rome, the Roman Empire fell due to decadence and debauchery. In popular discourse, it's not uncommon to hear that the Roman Empire supposedly fell due to the absurd level of decadence, laziness and debauchery among the Romans. Mental images are painted of rich Romans stuffing themselves with luxurious foods to the point of vomiting while enjoying orgies and gladiatorial games. The bread and circuses point is often harped on. But once again, this really couldn't be further from the truth. The gladiatorial games that people love to go on about were actually banned twice, first by Emperor Constantine the Great in 325, not having been a terribly effective ban, the games were banned a second time by the Emperor Honorius. The mad stories of wild orgies and culinary debauchery come primarily from what is widely considered to be the Golden Age of the Roman Empire, not the fall. From the Historia Augusta to the works of Suetonius, Tacitus and Cassius Dio, all of which were written before the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, and describe events from 100 BC to 284 AD. It's especially the accounts of unpopular emperors where these stories of debauchery run wild. Think Tiberius, Caligula, Nero. Here are some excerpts from the life of Commodus in the Historia Augusta. He never showed regard for either decency or expense. He diced in his own home. He herded together women of unusual beauty, keeping them like purchased prostitutes in a sort of brothel for the violation of their chastity. He kept among his minions certain men named after the private parts of both sexes, and on these he liked to bestow kisses. He also had in his company a man with a male member larger than that of most animals, whom he called Onos. This man he treated with great affection, and even made him rich, and appointed him to the priesthood of the rural Hercules. It is claimed that he often mixed human excrement with the most expensive foods, and he did not refrain from tasting them, mocking the rest of the company as he thought. He displayed two misshapen hunchbacks on a silver platter, after smearing them with mustard, and then straightaway advanced and enriched them. He pushed into his swimming pool his Praetorian prefect Julianus, although he was clad in his toga and accompanied by his staff, and he even ordered this same Julianus to dance naked before his concubines, clashing cymbals and making grimaces. He used to bathe seven to eight times a day, and was in the habit of eating while in the baths. He would enter the temples of the gods defiled with adulteries and human blood. He even imitated a surgeon, going so far as to bleed men to death with a scalpel. I hope these passages have illustrated my point. What people often forget when talking about the fall of the Western Roman Empire is that Roman society was profoundly Christian by the 5th century AD and with the rise of Christianity also came the rise of Christian morality. So, by modern standards, 5th century Roman society was very conservative, and especially the sexual morality was distinctively Christian. If you'd like to learn more about how Christianity transformed Roman society, I'd highly recommend the book Dominion by historian Tom Holland, or The World of Late Antiquity by Peter Brown. It should, however, be mentioned that some authors from late antiquity, such as Erosius and Salvian, saw the devastation in Roman lands during the 5th century as a direct consequence of the perceived heretical, sinful, and unchristian behaviour of the Roman people. They saw the wars that ravaged northern Italy and Gaul as direct punishment from God. In Salvian's book De Gubernazione Dei, meaning On the Government of God, he suggests that the inhabitants of Trier were still concerned with having circus games after having been sacked multiple times. Another example he cites is that of citizens in a wealthy city in Gaul still stuffing themselves to the brim with food while the city was being besieged. Salvian especially attacked wealthy Romans for their lack of Christian virtue and pitiful charity. The problem with sources such as Salvian here and Erosius is that they much more resemble a societal critique 
than actual historical inquiry, as dates, people, and precise locations are barely mentioned. The overarching point of both Salvian and Orosius's works is that the wars and barbarians were God's punishment for those who still held on to the belief of the old pagan gods. Those who were Christian in name only, those who were heretics, and those who willfully acted against God. In this, the two authors take a fair bit of inspiration from the Bible, with clear parallels to the tales of Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah and the Flood. The very fact that these works were some of the most copied and widely available throughout the Middle Ages only aided the solidification of the idea that Rome fell due to decadence and debauchery. Well, if you've made it this far into the video, I'd like to say thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd like to ask you to maybe leave a like and subscribe, and perhaps share the video with someone who you think might find it interesting. Once again, thank you very much for watching. See you next time.